I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. Can you see my presenter view? Uh, yep. And then can you see my mouse if I hover over it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's good. Okay. So um I always I always learn something new when Ben gives a talk. Um, so I learned lots during uh, those slides, Ben. Um, things that I've seen in charts numerous times. So it's nice that you explain those uh, terms and what they mean. Um, so here's the outline of my talk, and I'll go um, through the radiation therapy part in a little bit more detail. Uh, to continue from where Ben left off. So I'll touch on um, the simulation stage planning and then also uh, some parts of treatment. Um, so depending on the, the disease and the type of treatment that was selected, you'll see terms such as whole breast, um, chest wall, um, or some treatments will be breast plus superclav, breast superclav, posterior anterior boost, or then just breast then uh, intermammary nodes. Um, the discussion that I'll be talking about in terms of simulation and planning should apply to all uh, of these types of treatments. And um, there are astro guidelines um, that provide more information on standard clinical practices uh, in the US. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, our chief dosimetrist and medical physicist at UCSF, Dr. Zeke Ramirez and Emily Hirata, and they helped me um, gather this information that I'm going to present, which gives an overview of how we do simulation planning and treatment uh, at UCSF. So feel free to um, type questions in the chat, interrupt me. Um, we should also have some time at the end of these slides to, um, to answer questions as well. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about uh, patient setup um, and how we do things at UCSF. So most cases uh, are treated in supine position. Uh, with a breast board that's slightly inclined, and typically we use 10 degrees, um, although uh, that can be adjusted. Um, arms are usually raised and um, bent uh, onto our breast board, as shown here. This is a very typical breast board that we use, and we tilt the head uh, towards the contralateral side, so opposite side as to where we're treating. And uh, we also ensure that there are minimal skin folds uh, when we're setting up the patient. Ben uh, went through uh, placement of the wires and um, that's what's shown here in this 3D rendering of the patient surface. You can see the superior wire, the inferior wire, medial, lateral, and even um, wire where the lumpectomy scar is, um, and also the field of view of these breast tangents. And you can see that uh, a dosimetrist or a physicist uh, at treatment planning um, tries to match the field to these wires. Uh, and that's why uh, they're very important. And that's what we use to, um, to guide planning. We also position three reference points to help with setup, and these are the laser alignment points. Um, I've indicated them here. There is a, uh, an inferior, a superior, and a lateral point, and these three um, are marked. These three points are marked at SIM, and um, they're used during simulation. Uh, there are other patient setup techniques that uh, try to minimize tattoo marks, and they require um, different positioning software uh, and systems besides laser alignment, such as surface uh, guidance uh, at simulation and treatment. 
typical CT scan protocols um, that we use are three millimeter slice thickness. And we ensure that we scan the patient uh, above and below the wire borders. And we also ensure that there is no truncation of the body um, at CT SEM. Uh, so these are some of the key things that we focus uh, during simulation for breast treatments. Ben also mentioned deep inspiration breath hold. And um, as, as Ben showed, um, on the left here is a free breathing scan. And on the right, I'm giving an example of when a patient takes a, a, a breath hold, the air that they uh, inhale in their lungs will help separate the heart from the breast tissue that we're treating. Um, and in these uh, DRRs, digitally reconstructed radiographs, we can see that in free breathing, the heart here is contoured in green and it can come very close to the field. Um, and when a breath hold is taken, the heart is intended to be pushed away. Uh, and in treatment planning, uh, there have been many studies that have compared these two techniques, free breathing versus breath hold, and they have shown that you can reduce the dose uh, to the heart, the lung, um, and also um, the left descending artery. Uh, so breath hold techniques, uh, typically uh, here at UCSF at our clinic, uh, we use a motion management system such as variance RPM or some other way of measuring motion uh, on the surface to ensure that the patient is taking um, reproducible and consistent breath holds. During simulation, uh, things that we note for breath hold uh, is the breath hold amplitude and also the breath hold time. And those are things to use for uh, the amplitude for consistency of the breath hold and the breath hold time um, as um, we, we want the patients to, to hold their breath typically longer than 25 seconds to allow us to beam on and deliver enough of the radiation um, while also not requiring many breath holds uh, which can be tiring and uncomfortable for the patient if they have to take 10 or 20 breath holds during treatment. So a good left-sided breast uh, patient um, who, who's a candidate for deep inspiration breath hold um, should hold their breath for greater than 25 seconds. And during SIM, there should be some coaching to ensure that they can reproducibly hit the same breath hold amplitude um, as they practice their breath hold. So a breath hold technique is very beneficial for left-sided breast um, cancer patients. Um, and simulation uh, is a little bit more complicated as it requires coaching and noting amplitude and breath hold time for consistency. Great. So I'm going to shift a little bit into treatment planning, and I'm going to focus on uh, 3D techniques, uh, so 3D conformal and um, IMRT or VMAT. And I would just like to highlight the two main differences between 3D and IMRT or VMAT. Um, so in 3D planning, the planner uh, manually or in a forward manner, uh, adjusts the beam weights and the MLC shapes of each of the control points of the machine. And then afterwards, the planner will compute the dose and DVH. And then to optimize, they will continue to adjust the beam weights and MLC shapes to achieve the, the desired dose and DVH. So this is done in a forward planning method. IMRT or VMAT is reversed, it's flipped, and it's called inverse planning. So the planner will input the desired dose constraints 
and DVH. And then inverse optimization computes the beam weights and the MLC shapes. And then to optimize or to further adjust the plan, the planner will adjust those dose constraints um, or the objectives and the optimizer to achieve their DVH goals. And then the computer recalculates the MLC shapes. So this is just, this is just a, a big picture overview of um, 3D planning and uh, for, or forward planning and IMRT planning or inverse planning. In addition to um, 3D versus IMRT, uh, what goes along in the treatment planning process early on is the specification of a planning directive. Um, and here is an example shown here from our institution. And a planning directive is something that a physician puts in uh, to document the prescription dose, um, the OAR constraints, and the priorities for those constraints and prescription dose. So for example, this is a conventional fractionation. So it's 50 grain, 25 fractions. Um, a PTV can be drawn or it cannot be drawn, but typically a PTV will include uh, the breast tissue and also any nodes that are involved. And if there is a boost, then um, this is usually drawn as a, a boost, which is the cavity plus margins. Um, and that prescription also is specified. And here is a list of the organs at risk or OARs that we would be concerned about. And um, typical parameters for those organs are also listed and the limit that is uh, achievable. Uh, so for example, for lung, the volume that's receiving 20 gray um, has been shown um, to be an indication of uh, pneumonitis. So, um, so we have constraints of either 30% or 20% or better. Uh, on the V20 uh, for, for these plans. So a planning directive is very important uh, for both 3D and IMRT. Perfect. So the standard approach to 3D planning is a single ISO center. Um, and that's for all of the um, different types of treatments that you can have. If it's just whole breast, if it's chest wall, if it's breast plus superclav or posterior anterior boost, we always use a single isocenter and define our fields around it. So the isocenter is typically said set midway between the sup inf and medial lateral borders of the field and at a depth just posterior of the chest wall. And uh, if you can see my mouse, um, this point right here is um, the isocenter for this plan. And um, you can't see the soup inf, but it's midway between the soup and inf border. And then here's just a couple of centimeters um, posterior of the chest wall. Now, this is a good point to place the isocenter because when we place our standard two fields or tangents, we want our um, posterior beam blocked field line to go through the, uh, the medial and lateral wires. Um, if you can see those here on the CT, they're this, uh, this bright spot here, and it's a little bit harder to see, but it's over here, and also through the isocenter. Um, so this is typically how a tangent field is set. And what uh, half beam block means is that we have here our, um, uh, our isocenter, so zero on the uh, X uh, jaw that's placed right at the isocenter and through the wires, the medial and lateral wires here. And that's to ensure that there isn't any divergence of the beam um, as it enters the body. So that's why we use half beam block. And then uh, once Tommy? one tangent, yes. Um, we have a question in the chat if, um, mm -hmm. that I think is related. Uh, one is, is it okay to use a third field for conformity? Um, now, 
a, a third field in addition to tangents, like an on FOSS field or a super class field. So super class field would be a third field. I think they mean um, in addition to tangents. So typically, um, we 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 don't use we wouldn't use a third field like an on FOSS photon field. Um, tangents. Um, these two tangents can be used with field in field, which I'll talk about in the next slides to create a more uniform dose distribution. Um, so even though there are two fields, there are multiple control points, different MLC patterns in those two fields. And typically we wouldn't use a third one uh, for 3D plans unless we were trying to treat um, the super, um, the super cloud. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the then, reason why uh, and the reason why uh, we, Tommy, uh, sometimes yeah. uh, in our uh, cases the, we only treat breast or chest wall but their volumes going superiorly like uh, yeah. axilla slice are only two or three slices of the axilla so right. uh, in, in that cases we may need uh, the third field that's what yeah, so, so so typically we what we do at our center is we do uh, what we call high tangents, which just means that the superior uh, border is a little bit higher. And then we'll use MLC patterns uh, like the one shown here to block any part of the arm that might be in the field. We typically wouldn't add an additional field. Um, and I, I think you could if you did want to go more superior. Uh, but then you get to the risk of, um, you know, the junction of the fields um, can can always be a little bit tricky. But when you use a single ISO center, uh, that helps with um, with multiple fields. Um, so I, I understand why why you might want to use um, uh, a third field for uh, for superior uh, targets. Uh, but at our center, we typically go with uh, what we call high tangents um, and still just maintain two fields. And then if we if it is um, maybe a larger breast that we're treating, that's when we would use um, higher energy photons or a mixed uh, energy beam. Um, so we might have um, a, a pair of tangents that are at 6 MeV and then a pair of tangents that are at 10 MeV. Um, or 15, uh, if we want to reduce the hot spot there. In addition to uh, the half beam block, uh, we also like to ensure uh, two to three centimeters of flash. And flash is uh, the area uh, of air um, past the, the skin contour uh, to the MLC or the jaw. Um, so, and that's to ensure if there is uh, breathing um, that we aren't um, for, for a free breathing uh, treatment, that we aren't um, blocking any of the tissue over there. Um, another thing to uh, keep in mind is uh, to rotate the collimator to follow the chest wall. Again, that's illustrated here. So you can see that um, with the rib cage uh, on this DRR, uh, this collimator rotation is selected so that it uh, matches as closely as possible to this line of the chest wall. So the collimator rotation uh, on your tangents is also important. And then if you use wedges or, or field in field, um, those are used to reduce the hot spot, like Ben mentioned, uh, very important for reducing toxicity. Hmm, and I, I'm not, uh, oh yeah, go ahead, Ben. Oh, um, uh, one question in the chat is um, maybe related to the last slide. Um, are OAR tolerances um, different according to the treatment technique being used? So like, would you use different tolerances if you're using 3D conformal versus IMRT? So at our center, we do have different uh, tolerances. Um, for example, the ones shown here are for uh, non-DIPH. And maybe Ben, you can also uh, speak to this a little bit as well, but depending if you're doing hypofractionation or a boost um, or the size of the breast, you might allow for 
um, different uh, tolerances uh, for the OARs. And these are mm -hmm. uh, typically, I, I think we try and standardize them uh, before treatment. Uh, so for example, for these particular um, fractionations, we would use these dose constraints. Is that right, Ben? Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty, pretty accurate. I would say one, one thing though, that let's say we're treating, um, a left breast with 3D conformal or a left breast with IMRT, the, the OAR goals are still the same, but, um, the, the, the goal more depends on like, what's our prescription are we doing hyperfractionation or conventional fractionation or ultra hyperfractionation? Um, so it depends more on the prescription and the fractionation. And then we do uh, essentially challenge ourselves to have even better heart and lung constraints when we do DIBH. So that's like the main thing that changes when we do DIBH versus non-DIBH. I would say that whether or not you're using 3D conformal or IMRT, the OARs are the same. So you should try to respect them the same. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, let's just talk a little bit about why we would do um, dynamic wedges or field and field. If you have your tangents and you have an open field um, and um, you try and optimize your plan, maybe you adjust the calculation point, maybe you adjust the ISO center, um, at the end, you would still be left with a dose distribution that's really hot in the anterior. Um, and typically, we're even trying to uh, keep dose away from uh, the nipple or the scar tissue. Um, so this type of dose distribution is not very uniform or homogenous. So we would want to reduce that. And the way that we do it with um, uh, current linear accelerators is uh, we use a 3D field in field technique. And um, uh, the way we do that at our center is we would start with an open beam. And then we would make multiple control points. The number of control points that we use is typically between three to five, uh, depending on how hard we're trying to push the dose, maybe the shape of the breast. Um, and uh, most treatment planning systems uh, have uh, the ability to visualize uh, what we call dose clouds, or you can look at, for example, where is the 115% of the dose? And it would show up um, like it is over here. And then we shape our MLCs to block that 115 dose. So now we're going to weight um, this, um, this control point a little bit. And then we uh, would look at 110, and that usually is uh, more posterior. And then we set another control point along that dose cloud. And then we look at 105, and then we set that control point. And you get to a certain um, size here that's, that's really small, and that's and not worth having any more fields. So you would stop at that point, and you would do that on the other beam as well, the medial and the lateral. Uh, and typically, we would start with equal weighting for all of these fields. Um, typical weightings of, for example, one or two percent. Um, like, um, I guess I'm, I'm not going into a lot of detail in the forward treatment planning, but if both of the medial and lateral are 50, maybe you would make each of them or 50%, maybe you would make each of them 47 and then weight 1% to each of these. And then you can adjust the weighting of all of them um, to try and shape your dose. You don't wanna um, cause any um, of the prescription dose to break up. So um, if you, for example, weight uh, these fields too much and not the open beam, then you start to pull dose away from the chest wall and the skin surface, which um, is not ideal. But ultimately, what we're looking for is a plan that looks like this now with a field-in-field -field technique. And um, 
what we look for is we want to get as much of the 100% uh, to, uh, to the skin um, uh, as close as possible and all along the chest wall as well. And then uh, minimize the hot spot to be less than 10%. Uh, sometimes we can even achieve around 5%, uh, 5% uh, 105% hot spot. Um, and this, this is a typical 3D planning approach uh, using field in field. And uh, some cases are really easy to plan and um, you can sort of achieve this following this technique um, as, a, as, as a recipe. Uh, other cases um, are a little bit trickier and you end up playing and optimizing the beam weights a lot. Um, and you can also uh, add multiple energies. So you could add a 10 MV in addition to six and you know it gets a little bit more complicated. And that's, um, that's where treatment planning is a little bit of an art and it takes a lot of practice. So uh, I'll just talk a little bit about IMRT and VMAT. Uh, so um, IMRT uh, breast treatments, we uh, don't usually do these uh, with static fields at our center, um, but if you, uh, if they can be done and you uh, would select your gantry angles um, similar to your tangents, maybe a little bit more medial and lateral, and then add multiple fields as shown here along different gantry angles. And then uh, you want to be careful not to go through the other breast. Um, and then you would use inverse optimization to optimize the control points at each of these uh, different beam angles. Um, what we do at our center uh, is more of a VMAT approach, and we follow um, a VMAT technique um, that has been published uh, by um, a group from New York uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering um, about five years ago. And um, it can be done with as simple as two arcs, um, or uh, what they described here is this potential five arc partial arc approach, which uh, can be used for the cases when you do have super clav involvement and other nodes as well, as well like um, inner, inner nodes. And just very briefly, um, you basically uh, break down the arcs to cover different parts of your volume. So arc one and arc two here are what would be sort of high tangents field sizes. So they go all the way up to the neck um, and they're kind of, I'm, I'm just outlining them with my mouse. So uh, the two more red or pink uh, lines here are arc one and arc two, and they would be just anterior arcs. They wouldn't go uh, all the way to the uh, lateral. Arc three and arc four are what you could maybe get away with if you didn't have super clav involvement, and they're more uh, lateral um, and they go um, but they're not as superior. So they're a little bit um, uh, less superior and they would cover most of this breast. And then um, arc five can be used uh, as shown here in yellow to just focus on the superclav. So it would have the same uh, gantry start and gantry stop as arc one and arc two, but it wouldn't have as an inferior of a border so the, the field, uh, the jaw limits would be set to just cover the super clav. And this uh, VMAT uh, multiple arc technique uh, has been suggested to, uh, to, um, to achieve better dose distribution and allow for more conformality. Uh, you could just have, uh, you know, like just arc one and arc two, a counterclockwise and a clockwise arc that goes from gantry start, middle, gantry stop, lateral. Um, but it can be a little bit tricky if you're trying to avoid going through the arm and having control points that still pass through the arm when you're trying to deliver dose to the superclav. So this type of beam arrangement uh, we use um, to have just a little bit more control of the VMAT optimization technique. Uh, but I, I'm sure there are other configurations that you can use as well. Um, th this this works well. And then uh, just a hey, little Tommy? bit of a, yes. Um, if there's uh, IMN uh, involvement uh, or, or like you want to cover the IMNs, does this 
five arc arrangement work also as you described yeah this this would also be for iman involvement yeah and in, in particular when you have nodes um you if you break it down with this uh five arc technique you can um more easily push dose to those nodes that you would draw those with those um, IMN nodes. Mm -hmm. um, it can get a little bit trickier if you're just doing it with two arcs. Uh, with two arcs, it would be the simplest, but it's just again a little bit harder to control. So for uh, electron boost to the tumor bed, which is what we would uh, typically use, our approach is to have an on FOSS field. Um, so this means um, a beam that is uh, perpendicular to the skin. And um, at our center, we use an SSD of 105. And we base our energy off of um, the depth of the tumor and uh, where we're trying to prescribe. And then the field shape, we use the tumor bed um, to uh, create the, the field shape of our cutout. Um, it's important to, uh, because the wires that are there in SIM won't be there during simulation, and typically there is a, a, a wire for the scar, it's important to zero out the density of those wires so that you're not doing your dose calculation with the wires present. Um, and then we have our typical fractionation. We prescribe to the 90% isodose. And um, a 3D surface of the skin is generated, and we include that with our treatment plan document uh, to help with setup, as typically electron boosts are what we would call clinical setup, meaning that we don't do any imaging for them, but we set them up just based off of an SSD check and the field light with the cutout um, based off of our um, treatment plan and our surface rendering. So this is typically done with what we call a clinical setup. So not using imaging. And this is a good segue to get into the treatment uh, part and uh, for patient setup, what we typically use um, uh, to image is we use portal or MV imaging. And um, here I'm showing uh, an MV image on the left and the corresponding DRR on the right. And uh, typically we check the separation of the chest wall uh, from our MLC uh, point. And uh, we also check um, the, um, the superior and inferior border matches with what we have in treatment planning. We can also check that the flash is adequate as well um, when we're setting up the patient. And um, you can quantify these and you can even record um, certain values. Um, and that would be a way of being more quantitative with your patient setup. Um, but typically, uh, this is how we set up a patient. And we would do this type of imaging uh, daily. And then for more VMAT or IMRT uh, at our center, we do uh, cone beam CT um, if your LENAC has uh, onboard imaging. And this is uh, we'll, this here on the left is a CT from simulation, and on the right is a cone beam. And uh, we would match the cone beam to the CT. The delivery um, of these plans, even VMAT, is usually pretty quick. Um, and what do I mean by pretty quick? After you, you know, you set up the patient, um, you can deliver this these this dose in probably a minute, two minute max. Um, if you're doing deep inspiration breath hold, um, the treatments tend to be a little bit longer, uh, just because you'd have to instruct the patient to hold their breath, and then ensure that they are holding a consistent breath as simulation, and then you would beam on. Um, if your machine doesn't have automatic uh, beam control. Um, so those treatments can be a little bit more complicated. And I just like to talk a little bit about um, plan QA uh, without um, going too much into the details of it. But here's an acronym from ASTRO, 
which recommends uh, some things that physicists and RTTs should check when looking at a plan. Um, so it's really important to review contours uh, to ensure that um, something isn't contoured uh, uh, inappropriately, like uh, like big mistakes or um, this is something that's just totally missed. Uh, beam arrangements and fields, uh, for example, their naming convention. Uh, it's good to standardize naming convention, and you want to make sure that the medial field is actually the, med the medial field and the lateral is actually the lateral. Um, you want to look at the coverage uh, on the DVH, but also on the dose distribution and review hot spots and um, homogeneity of the dose. Uh, look at dose constraints of the organs at risk. And um, also very important is to ensure that the prescription matches the planning directive in the treatment planning system. And when we do uh, plan QA, uh, I've broken it down into sort of three stages that you can uh, QA a, a particular plan. And the first part is um, TPS, or you're QAing the treatment planning dose. And the way that we do that is we use a secondary uh, software, which is independent of the treatment plan, um, and it computes uh, the MUs based off of the control points and the prescription point. Um, and we ensure that that's uh, less than five, there's a less than 5% difference in terms of the MU. And that's typically what we do for 3D conformal plans. Um, the other two, uh, point 0.2 and point 0.3, machine QA and, and plan specific QA um, are, are optional and depending on your clinic guidelines and the case, um, I think they should be considered. So for a machine QA, you would want to, if it's a, maybe it's a VMAT technique or an IMRT um, with a patient, you basically would just QA that the plan is deliverable and you can load it on the machine and there aren't any clearance issues. Uh, so, so this can be done before treatment, um, or it can be done a, a day prior to ensure that if a replan is needed, that you have enough time to, to perform a replan. And then for VMAT and IMRT at our clinic, we also perform, um, we make a measurement or a, a QA plan on a phantom, and that's where you deliver the plan, and then you compare a point measurement or multiple points um, to your treatment planning system. So you, may, you make a physical measurement comparison. Um, just some other things um, to consider uh, when looking at a plan. Um, uniform coverage is, uh, is obviously a very high priority. Uh, we wanna make sure that we're treating um, uh, the entire PTV. Um, and then lung, heart, breast um, doses are important. Um, physics checks also uh, should include looking at um, tuning structures or dosy structures to try and achieve a conformal dose with IMRT or VMAT. And it's also important to look at low dose regions um, to ensure that, again, beam arrangements are appropriate and dose isn't spilling into areas um, which might cause complications. And Ben touched on the complications. Um, uh, that we would like to avoid. Um, skin toxicities um, uh, are, are, are common in some, in some breast treatments. And uh, when we perform our plan QA, we're really trying to avoid these complications. Uh, moist desquamation um, is related with these skin folds and the dose buildup effect that Ben mentioned. Um, arm lymphedema, um, you know, could be a result of an improper um, beam arrangement, or if you have um, your uh, your field marks uh, not uh, set properly, and uh, we want to look at the DVH and um, our doses to reduce the uh, chance of patients developing pneumonitis and cardiac toxicities. Um, so. I, th I think these are the important reasons why we perform plan QA before delivering a treatment uh, to ensure low complications and also uh, effective treatment. And those are all the slides that I had. So I'm happy to answer questions together with you, Ben. I'll stop sharing. I'm also happy to answer questions together with you, Tommy. 
Um, we had several great questions. Um, and um, Asad, thank you so much again for having us. Um, if you'd like, we can take some time to answer some of these questions. Okay, great. Um, you can probably see in the chat uh, one question from Ali is, what is the dose near sternum at 3D conformal technique? Um, the dose nearer sternum. I'm not sure I understand the yeah. question. Yeah, Ali, would if you would like, could you um, um, uh, uh tell us more about your question? You can unmute yourself and you can ask the question directly, like. But in the meantime, uh, we can take another question. Uh, this is yeah. my question, how we can incorporate breathing effect in VMAT planning. So uh, what we do in our center that uh, we make pseudo PTV, which is uh, like uh, one CM out from the body and we place 1.3 CM bolus uh, to give uh, margin of air margin of breathing effect. So this is how we used to do the VMAT planning. Yeah, that's a that's a really good point. Um, adding bolus and um, increasing margins, I think, are the way to account for um, for breathing effects. We used to follow some paper. Uh, I don't remember the reference right now, but uh, we are following some paper in which it was giving that uh, make a pseudo PTV and uh, then pseudo bolus in the breast. And then once uh, the optimization was done, then we make a copy of that plan and delete those pseudo bolus and check the doses on the original P2. This is how we used to do the VMAT planning. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure um, for our free breathing um, VMAT plans to. Do you know um, what we do like for right-sided cases, Tommy? I think we um, we we generally don't use bolus um, unless there's a, a particular reason for for bolus, but we we wouldn't do it for just free breathing. Yeah, and um, and typically we we don't um, we. Yes, yeah, we do have uh, a PTV. So the PTV is usually drawn with um, margin, but I don't think we have additional margin for free breathing. It's our standard margin that we use from CTV to PTV. Mm -hmm. the, the one thing I might be cautious about, uh, and this may not be a, an issue, but um, with the bolus, um, just increasing the acute toxicities if you're getting higher skin dose with your plan. Um, but if if patients are making it through treatments okay, then um, uh, then that's that's okay. But if if you were doing your your planning and then were limited by skin toxicity, um, you could also um, I think have a plan that doesn't have bolus and you could uh, sort of like alternate those days or or do the first part of the plan with the bolus. And then once the skin toxicity is, is getting too bad, um, switch to the plan that doesn't have bolus to finish up the treatment. Um, I, I've seen people get a little creative. <laughs> yeah. Um... I saw that um, Ali uh, wrote in the in the chat that uh, sternum go into the CTV. Um, I think oh, I think okay. I think like typically you would have to uh, physician would have to make a judgment call in terms of priority of trying to reduce dose to the sternum versus getting coverage. Um, so as as a planner, I would look at or I would speak with a physician in terms of priority of, of um, do we want to spare the OAR or undercover the CTV there? Um, and I don't know what we typically do in those cases. 
but a, a discussion um, is the way to go. All right, I think um, we have other questions. What are the differences between identify and RPM used in relation to motion management at CTSIM and LINAC? Um, so RPM is um, typically just a, a plastic box that's placed on the patient's um, uh, chest or, or abdomen, and um, it has reflective markers and it tracks patient motion based off how that box moves. Um, identify is, um, it doesn't have anything on the patient. It uses a surface uh, imaging um, to, to acquire a surface of the patient. Um, those are, those are the main, main differences. Um, both can be used for deep inspiration breath hold. Um, I see another question on, uh, what is the minimum requirement MU in each field and field? And is there a minimum field size requirement in each field and field? Um, that's a great question and something that uh, can be checked, um, I think, in, in commissioning. Um, so typically for field and field, we say um, no less than two MU uh, at our clinic, and we don't have a field size minimum that I'm aware of. Um, um, but that's a good point. I mean, we wouldn't want to have very, very small control points. Usually when planning, the last field in field um, is the smallest. And when looking at it, the overall field is never like a small field, but there are certain MLCs that come really close. And um, uh, in, in your LINAC commissioning, you would set that gap minimum and your TPS will, would not go below that value. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how we would ensure that. Is it required to do daily cone beam CT uh, when you treat with VMAT? Is daily KV imaging enough? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, we, um, we do... Uh, we do daily cone beam CT for our VMATs, but I have heard of other centers doing weekly cone beam CT, and then you can do daily ports or KV. Um, so uh, I also know that that is used. Um, so it depends on the clinic, but um, sometimes daily cone beam CT might not be necessary uh, for breast treatment. So I, I understand that as well. Uh, sometimes breast of VMAT QA is easy to fail. Is it normal? Um, I'm so I haven't noticed breast VMAT QA failing more than other um, plans. I think um, it um, it shouldn't normally occur. And uh, the previous question on the you know minimum MUs. Um, and the minimum field size, um, you know, that's also something to check with control points um, in a VMAT plan, not just in 3D. Um, and I think that becomes more of a question about um, IMRT or VMAT QA. Um, maybe there's something about the optimization of the breast plans um, that's causing it to fail. Um, so it would depend on a lot of factors uh, that a physicist would look into. Uh, we are seeing a lot of breast implants and tissue expanders recently, which create loads of artifacts. Uh, what is your advice to account for these artifacts in both 3D and VMAP plan? Um, yeah, it's a great question. And Ben, also uh, curious to hear your thoughts. Um, you know, it's something that uh, you could density override um, in, in treatment planning. Um, that's, that's what you would do during treatment planning. At, at simulation, um, you could have an optimized CT scan protocol for mm -hmm. uh, implants. Um, 
some CT scanners even have artifact reduction. So if you know, um, if your scanner has that, you can turn on artifact reduction, um, which is a post-processing technique. And you can even adjust the, the strength of the artifact reduction, uh, something that should be tested out in CT commissioning uh, to ensure that the HU uh, values um, are still uh, representative of density. Uh, on your density curve. So um, that's something that I would I would look at. I mean, Ben, if you see a CT mm -hmm. and it has a lot of artifacts, you know, what would you be thinking? Um, at uh, I think some of the same things. Yeah. Um, could we use a protocol to reduce artifact? Um, if not, if if there's clearly a lot of streak artifact, streak artifact you can density override um and then if there's a part where it's the metal itself um sometimes what our physicists will do is they'll try to find out from the manufacturer what kind of metal is this and then apply that density for that part of a device um it's uh it's definitely a new challenge that I think a lot of people are struggling with. You're not alone. Awesome. I think we went through all the questions. Yeah, uh, one query. Um, we used to uh, set the patient on the wet clock. Uh, we are not using the breast board and not giving any elevation. So is there... What kind of difference between that uh, these two setups? Like uh, it says, better to have a breastboard or wet clock will be okay. Yeah, I'm. I I haven't seen um, a a lot of setups with vac clock bags. I've I've always seen breastboard. Um, I I think a breastboard is just typically a, a faster simulation than a backlog, but um, I, I could see, I could see both being used. Um, so, like some centers have a uh, bore, a uh, city bore is quite small. So the transport cannot be entered. So they, they, they use the backlog then. So, like in planning point of view, it's, uh, uh, the patient plan will be okay on both the cases because I we think, are optimizing on 3D plans or IMRT plans. Yeah. Um, I think the incline on the breastboard helps with the positioning of the arm um, and sort of treating the more superior part. Um, and, and the incline also helps helps with that. Um, so I, I would I, I've I would almost have to look at a couple of cases to look at um, to look at how for for three D cases what the what the field arrangement would look like without any incline versus with incline and uh, and backlog. Um, 